So um, good morning, everybody. Um, huge warm welcome to all of you. Um, and uh, I've got a real delight today because I'm talking to somebody who's been, in my view anyway, in my book, extremely brave in the decision that she's made to completely radically alter her life at the moment of retirement, which makes her a retirement rebel, which is what she calls herself. And um, she actually decided that she would become peripatetic, which means that she would be free to go wherever she wanted because she was going to live in a motorhome. Um, we have in Film Club recently, we've, we've watched a couple of films. Um, one was called Nomadland, which was about Amer a, a woman in America who also lived in um, that kind of peripatetic lifestyle go, uh, going around but hers was forced on her by circumstances because she lost her home her marriage or her husband died I think and then uh, the the place that she lived was uh, was no longer viable to live there and then the other one was Lady in the Van which was the Alan Bennett uh, film with Maggie Smith who was absolutely brilliant in it and again that was a, that was quite a sad story in lots of ways but this isn't a sad story this is a joyful story in lots and lots of ways because this is about about somebody choosing um, a completely different way of life. And I want to start off by asking Siobhan, um, you know, exactly uh, what was behind her decision in 2019, I think it was, to do what she's done. So over to you, Siobhan. We're all desperately interested to hear your story. I'm, I'm really pleased to have been asked to tell my story because my whole reason for doing what I'm doing as well is to inspire other women to just live their life with a bit more vigour. Um, I, in 2019, was far from living my life with vigour. I was absolutely broken because I'd had two siblings who died of lung cancer. I'd had to have a hysterectomy. Um, for precancerous cells. I was struggling in the workplace, feeling voiceless and marginalised. And I was just angry with life and completely broken. And I remember crying one day with my daughter, just saying, I want to stop pretending. I want to find my happy place. And I think an awful lot of women at that age, in your mid-50s to 60, start thinking, what the heck's this all about? What do I really want to do? What's going to make me really happy? And so... I was heading up to 60. I knew I could get my um, work pension. I worked at the BBC for 30 years and I knew I could get a BBC pension at 60. So I made the decision to retire. Um, and you say um, I was brave to do it. I think life made me brave. I felt I had no other option. I felt so low, so broken that I just thought I, I'm going to go off there. So I retired at 60 got rid of my home and all my possessions, much to the horror of all my family and friends. It still makes me giggle now when I say it, because it was absolutely crazy. And I went with bags literally into, into charity shops. I invited friends around for dinner and I'd say, take what you want. They'd leave with lamps and books and plates and dishes and things. And I just got rid of everything. Um, and I still don't know to this day why motorhome, because I'd never holidayed in one. I'd never driven one. But because I was in all this turmoil, there was all sorts of things every night going around in my head. And one morning I woke up and I literally thought, motorhome, that's it, that's it. And so I bought myself a motorhome without having a clue what I was doing and hit the road in 2019 thinking somehow it's all going to work out. I don't know how, but somehow it's going to. And I'm 65 now. I've been on the road five and a half years and I can tell you I'm the happiest I'm, I've ever been. Well, that's really, really good to hear because, uh, you know, hearing you describe it like that, that's, you know, that's almost like a, um, it, it's what people who, who find religion do, isn't it? You know, they give everything away and they want to live a monastic life, you know, bring their life down to the absolute bare minimum and possibly live in a, in a cell with a single bed, you know, you know what I mean? Um, so it's a similar kind of sense for, that I'm getting from you of, of, of a of a moment in your life when you just thought all of this stuff that I've got is somehow mm. dragging me down. This is, this is keeping me in a place where I don't want to be and your solution is to get rid of it. And then of course you had the idea of the motorhome. So I, I suppose you've just said, you know, happiest you've ever been. So tell us about all the, all the great things that there are to know about the way that you now live, because it's very, very different from how most people live. And I, I have to be absolutely honest here. It's kind of one of my worst nightmares. So you, you tell me what your, <laughs> Honestly, what the best thing for you is. 
I live my life like I did before, but it's like playing doll's house every day. I still have my friends. I still meet up with my friends. I'll meet them at train stations, go traveling. I still do dinner parties for people. I'm My nickname's Champagne Siobhan, and it's, I'm hanging on in there with that. And I've got a gin bar. I don't know if you can see it somewhere behind me. I've got a gin bar. You know, so I live life to the full. But the thing for me about the way that I'm living is I am living before I was existing in turmoil. I was working long hours to earn lots of money and I had a good salary, good life to buy lots of things. And just, I wasn't happy. I was screaming inside. I was a broken woman. And I know from giving my talks, there are so many women out there feeling the same because they feel bullied and marginalized in the workplace as they get older. That's a big problem. But so I was just existing. What I've found now is I'm living. I really am living. I've learned to live in the moment. Um, my mum spent years with these compendium of books trying to get us to learn flowers and trees and all sorts and connect with nature. And I was just too busy partying and my career ladder. I wasn't sort of, I'd go to the Lake District for walks with friends and weekends, but all I wanted was the partying afterwards in the pub, really. I didn't really connect. Now, one of the best things that I do is make myself a cup of coffee in the morning, throw open the door, sit on the doorstep and just listen. Listen to the birds, listen to the trees. I lie down and look at the clouds. I used to do that as a child and it made me so happy and so calm. I stopped doing it for 40 years. Now at 65, I am that crazy woman you'll see in the middle of a field lying down, looking at the clouds and feeling really happy. So I suppose those are the things I'm, I'm living, really living now. I've also, as you can probably notice, found my voice, found my confidence, found my inner warrior because I've spent most of my life to post 60 feeling worthless and not good enough and I, I, I always wanted people even people I didn't like I wanted them to be my friends I wanted their approval which was crazy it stems back from things in my childhood but you know I, I am happy and that's that's one of the big bonuses of, of what I'm doing I'm living yeah well the, you've certainly sold it very forcefully um in that sense and uh, I love the idea of um taking the time to live in the moment, if there's a bird singing or something, you stop and listen rather than think thinking very quickly as you dash by. Oh, there's a bird singing. You know, I haven't got time to listen to that. Um, so, so uh, where are you right at this moment? What's outside your door right now? I am in Yeadon. I don't know. You can't really see. I'm on a little site, a CL site for the Caravan and Motorhome Club. They've got these sites that only take five vehicles. I've got a beautiful view over the, the autumn coloured trees in the distance and it's near Yeadon Airport so not far from Leeds because I'm okay. heading up towards Scotland I'll, I'll be in Scotland by this evening because okay. I'm catching a ferry on Friday to go to Northern Ireland I'm going to spend three weeks just exploring the coastal road because I love it when there's nobody there and it's winter and rainy and you know right. I like to be antisocial and walk along the cliffs so yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Okay, so so you've you've again you've sold us the advantage of um, a continually a continually changing panorama outside your 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 window. I mean, I'm looking out of my window into my little garden in in Wimbledon, but that's the you know that's the view I'm going to have tomorrow morning as well when I get up. So yours is constantly changing. Um, so you know you've sold us the you've told us the all, all the upsides. There must be a few downsides. So um, let let's just explore if there are any any drawbacks to uh, to what you're doing. I think honestly, for me, there are, are not any downsides. But that doesn't mean I don't have bad days. I do have bad days, and I have miserable days. And I post a lot on my Instagram, Siobhan Siobhan, um, to to show people my authentic life and and if I've got a, a bad day I'll sort of say I don't know why I've woken up today just feeling really down miserable um at the winter time I don't mind that people think I struggle in the winter but I'm warmer in here actually than my flat my flat was very drafty so I've got I've got it all nicely insulated in in um, Dora the Explorer and my motorhome so for me there aren't any particular downsides I do miss my bunch of girlfriends. I get invited a lot to join swimming groups and Nordic walking groups and various groups and go and talk to women's groups around the country. And when I hear the banter and the interaction and they've supported each other probably through the death of, of, of partners or children or breast cancer or, you know, and you know that support, I think, gosh, I miss my friends. Although, like I say, I do see them and I do Zoom chat with them. It's not the same as, as just being able to pop round and connect with them so I miss that that's that's the one downside 
and I miss soaking in the bath. <laughs> but that's all oh, minor things, really. Yeah, I mean, they're all things that you can um, you can sort of kind of cope with. Yeah, you know, yeah. None, none of you know, none of those are so major that uh, that you can't cope with them. Um, I'm really interested. You did mention it, but. Um, when I was 65, as uh, most of the people on this uh, this call or watching this video will know, my my sort of existential crisis led to me starting Look Fabulous Forever, so starting a new business. <laughs> and um, I can remember when I, I, I'd I started to explore it when I sat down on Mother's Day with my two daughters and told them what I was thinking of doing. And I could sense a bit of eye rolling. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like... Um, Yes, okay. And Anna has since admitted. Anna, who is now, of course, our group managing director of both the uh, of the Look Fabulous Rubber Business and the, the factory that we have, um, she uh, said that her first thought was, oh, well, if this doesn't work, mum will just end up with a spare room full of makeup that she can flog on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you, darling. That's nice. Uh, that's nice that you had so much faith. But there was a bit of eye roll. But I think they both thought, yeah, uh, I mean, they were terrifically supportive in, in, in many, many ways, encouraging, do it, you know, of course you must do it, all that sort of stuff. So I'm very interested to know, because what you did was way, way more radical than what I did in lots of ways. So um, what was the reaction of your friends and family? You've got a daughter, haven't you? So was Mantha. it... Samantha how old is she she's 36 now okay so where does she live uh Tunbridge Wells right okay so right down at the bottom of the of the country so uh, so tell us what what they said to you and 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 did you come under any pressure to to change your mind yes um my daughter she could see I was broken she knew that I needed to do something but she was quite a bit alarmed when when it was sort of get rid of the home and the possessions we used to go it took weeks to do it I did it over a few weeks to get rid of everything and we used to go up to town for coffee and we'd walk past charity shops and she'd actually say to me mum is that yours <laughs> we ended up <laughs> laughing about it in the end but um they were they were worried they didn't know what I was doing but I didn't know what I was doing it was sort of my last chance saloon I really was so broken um <clears throat> but now they've seen that I've, I've got a, a good book out retirement rebel I've got a podcast out retirement rebel life after 60 I'm I'm um, an ambassador for the caravan and motorhome club I'm doing all kinds of things that are positive and I'm thriving and I'm happy she's now telling all her friends about me they're all buying my book they're telling the mums about me so that you know I've got her 110 percent support my other brothers and sisters they do support me I'm from a big family I'm one of eight they do support me but whenever there's a family function there's always that moment where I think oh here we go and there's that kind of they move over and it's like right so when are you going to buy another flat when, when it, don't you think you need to get on the property market? Don't you think? You need, and it's no, I, I'm just going to keep doing this as long as it makes me feel I'm living, I'm happy. So I think I've got them on board. I did, funnily enough, lose a few what I thought were friends because I think they were a bit embarrassed. They liked sort of Siobhan from the BBC. And when it was Siobhan trailer trash or, you know, Siobhan living in a bath, they didn't quite know where to pop me in their life and then once I've started being I was on this morning the other week and I was on woman's hour um a couple of weeks ago they start coming out the woodwork again and it's like no 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 I I'm I'm the same person it's not about this was my problem it was all about the trimmings that that you know I wasn't connecting so no yeah. I've got support that's good uh interesting that you say about the different reaction of friends um, I always think I had this experience because we, um, when I was still married, uh, through my husband's job, we we had to uproot and go and live in Sweden, and um, which is quite a long way away. And, and most people don't even know where Sweden is. They look at a map and think, oh, gosh, that's quite far north. Anyway, um, I can remember telling people and the reaction I got used to be a projection of their fears. Yes. So I can remember one friend saying, oh, God, that's a long way, you know, oh, it's really cold and dark in Sweden and don't, doesn't everybody commit suicide? You know, it's like, like all these myths. And I can remember thinking, you're talking about yourself here. You're not talking about me because that's not, you know, I was, 
I mean, I had to sort of rearrange my life, but I did manage to rearrange my life. And I kind of commuted between Stockholm and, and London for a couple of years. And then eventually my marriage broke up. But the thing was that for me, I saw it in terms of adventure, excitement, a change, a positive change and all that kind of thing. So I think that those friends who reacted like that were thinking, God, I'd hate that, or I couldn't do that, or she's mad because, she, you, know, you know, I mean, the property ladder is a big thing in this country. We're all obsessed by it. You know, where are think, you on the property ladder? No, and I think that's where we've got it wrong. This obsession with having to have four walls and stay in the same place. Yeah. People say, I own my own house. No, you don't. You own a massive debt, the majority of people. Yeah. And that massive debt stops you from living, stops you from moving around. I think we've, we've, we're have we forced down this way of living that is yeah. just alien. I'm, I'm really listening to my inner voice and my intuition with things that I do when I go for walks and yeah. really connecting. And I'm realizing we've shut off so much about what makes us human beings and makes us live and makes us connect because we have to live this lifestyle. And I yeah. think we need to rethink it. Otherwise, we're all going to be so poorly. Yeah, but also, you know, it's bad for the planet. I mean, you know, the consumption stuff, <laughs> the, 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 I think of it as stuff, which is all the things that you've got in your cupboard that you never take out, never look at, never use, never wear, never you know never see and you think why have I got that in there it's it's serving absolutely no purpose so there's no question that we um we drag ourselves down we weight ourselves down with stuff but then for some people uh and I will include myself a little bit in this it's security and it's also a sense of um of being anchored to the to the earth if you like not free floating so you know what you're doing feels quite um in that sense the uh, a, a kind of like a free floating experience. That's the only way I can express it at the moment. But anyway, uh, it's it's. I think it's a very very interesting conversation to have with people, and it's something that we should have more conversations about because you know where are we going with this planet? Um, the the ne my next question is really about something that would would also concern me a little bit. You're a woman. Um, you're also an older woman, and we we have to accept that. Um, do you feel any vulnerabilities in being that? You know, a, a female and an older female on your own in a motorhome. Are, are there any? Is there any sense in which you feel vulnerable? Vulnerable because of that? No, I don't feel vulnerable, but I do very much listen to my inner voice. And if I get to a place where I don't like it, I just think move on. You know, right. if no rhyme or reason, no rational things. But I take all the necessary safety precautions. When I was a woman on my own in a flat, it was a ground floor flat. You know, I felt more nervous, I think, than I do with this. There's a great community um, on the, these sites and people will support you. And I would never worry about going and knocking on another van and saying, can you help me with this? Or I'm stuck with that. Not that I've ever had to, to be honest. Um, and I, I've got alarms and I've got all kinds of locks and things that I put, but I'm not, it's one step too far for me to go and park on the side of a road or mm -hmm. do wild camping and that a lot of people are doing now in their vans. Um, I do wild camp in Scotland, but it's geared up for that. You, even the councils have got spots where you text them and then you pay five pounds and the Isle of Harrison is in the Outer Hebrides you can wild camp so I kind of do controlled wild camping um, but I'm also like I say an ambassador for the Caravan and Motorhome Club so I can stay on any of their club sites and I also I'm going to Northern Ireland now because I'm going to be staying on their CL certificated location sites where they've got five vehicles on like this one and showing you know that you can still travel in the winter time when the big sites might be closed there's all these little ones that are open so again I feel safe going on those sites so I don't no I don't feel unsafe and I make sure that I've learnt about my oil and water and tyres and all the safety mechanical things that I need to do and I get those regularly checked so I don't put myself in a vulnerable position yeah, that's uh, that, that's incredibly important. And I love the idea that um, there's a sort of community that you immediately lock into when you stop because people, you know, people are usually, in my experience, lovely. And actually, if you ask for help, that help is often forthcoming. So, uh, and and the fact that you are a woman on your own um, and not in your first flush of of youth means that people respond even more positively to you. Again, that's my experience. 
Um, it's it's weird because we tend, we tend to think that people are horrible to old people, but actually they're lovely. And, um, you know, if somebody offers me a seat on the tube, which they often do now, um, I always accept it because I think they've made if they've made the offer to to offer you a seat, then you should very gracefully say, oh, thank you so much. That's so kind and sit down because you know, they've drawn attention to themselves. It's quite, for some people, it's embarrassing to do that. But it's like, so I, I do accept. I don't, I don't think, oh, how dare you offer me a seat? Because I, you must think I'm old. I think, yeah, I'm old. I need a seat. So I sit so down. When I first started out in the motorhome, like I say, I had never driven one, never holidayed. I did not have a clue. And I was the entertainment for other people on the, the, the site. I used to fill my tank. I got somebody to fill the tank initially. And then I'd top it up. I had a little love heart bucket and a watering can and I'd go backwards and forwards and I could see people positioning the seats as if to say what the heck's she doing yeah. and they'd come out and offer me advice and show me how to do, put the connector right. together and you know so at the very beginning people were, were, were helped me they didn't want me to to sink you know so that's when I realized there was a community out there absolutely um, I think you've already touched on this but um, I'd like to know how you plan your your time um you you've already you know you said you're you're at the moment just outside Leeds you're going up to Scotland did you say going up to Scotland so you can get the ferry and you're going to Northern Ireland so how far ahead in you know do you, do you have a schedule or don't you well let's put it this way I'm heading up to Cairn Ryan where I'm getting the ferry um tomorrow morning but I don't know where I'm staying yet so what, in Cairn Ryan Okay, I'd, or I might stay before. What I'll do is, I know it's it's about five hours drive or something, so I'll drive as far as I can, and then I'll look in, in the um, club handbook for the CL sites, um, and I'll find myself a site nearby, and I'll go and stay. So I go with the flow. I sort of have a vague plan. Like, I know I'm going to Ireland for three weeks, and I booked on the first site, but then I don't know. I'll, I don't know if I'll go clockwise or anti-clockwise. Okay. I'll just see you know, what, what what I feel like doing. But how long have you had the plan to go to Northern Ireland? I finished talking at the, the um, NEC um, a, a week ago and I talked to one of the people from the Caravan Club because every year after I've done the talk there, I go off on an adventure. I've done the Outer Hebrides. I went to Southern Ireland. Last year I went to Orkney for five weeks. And I said, do you know what? I'm thinking about Northern Ireland and staying on CL sites. And they said, oh, my God, we'd love you to do that because, you know, so I said, right, I'll go to. So it was a week ago that I decided, right, I'll go, I'll go for, and I'm only going for three weeks because I've got to come back because I know I'm going to a Christmas gathering. It's an early one on the 23rd of November, back down in London. So <laughs> I'll come back on the 21st and then I've got to scoot down to London for a ladies gathering. I mean, that's that's the just the way I go, but I enjoy it. And if it's a long journey in the motorhome driving down, I sing to myself, I've got snacks on the seat and I just enjoy it. And when and when you are travelling like that, stopping is that? Are there ever any restrictions, or are you always? I, I have no concept of how big your motorhome is, um, and you know, even if you tell me, I, I don't know whether I'd be able to visualise it. But you know, you're not driving a car. That's what I'm trying to say. So it's like a transit van. It's six meters long, so the length of a transit van. It's not, you know, it's 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 a chunky size. Um, okay. It's two and a half metres wide and sit just over six metres long. Um, okay. I, I, when I go to service stations, if I'm driving up, um, then I'm able to go into where there, there are places for caravans and vans now on most of them. Um, mm. But also, I, it's supermarkets, basically you just drive around and you have to take two slots. And um, it is harder to find places to park. But I, I'm used to it now after five and a half years. I can sort of, and I Google map places so I have a look and I think oh yes I'll be able to park there if there's a little or something I want to pop to I think oh yes I'll be able to park there or I think oh no there's no way that I can park there yeah and talking about little um emptying your loo and getting food <laughs> yeah, no 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 they're all they're all logistical things um I do a supermarket shop when I'm going like for Northern Ireland now what I try to do is I've, I do a very basic shop and then I like to, to shop local I like to invest in the local community I like to try the local foods and wines and whatever they've got on offer bush mills I'll be heading there um yeah. so there's all sorts of foods that I like trying their cheeses and everything so I don't do big supermarket shops where I can help it but 
um, when I'm just here traveling around, I'll do a super big lo- little shop or a, an oldie shop and then stock up on my basics and then shop, you know, as I go around. Um, and you haven't answered the question about the loo. Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> avoiding it. You know really? what? I, po- <laughs> I posted on TikTok a video. Um, I'm on TikTok under Siobhan Daniel Six, and 52,000 people have watched this video of me talking about emptying my loo. You think people need to get out more? But um, I'm basically I empty it at this little sites when I'm on. I can go four or five days where I don't have to empty it, and I can go to the club sites and empty it. But I always empty it on sites. But when you're traveling around, a lot of um, boat yards and places like that you can empty them a lot of graveyards there's water taps people know who are in this kind of nomadic community where they can empty the gray waste and where they can get water from and also um, a lot of sites now are providing places where you can empty your toilets and you just pay 10 pounds or something like that because there's a growing community but that is one of the downsides actually those the because there's a growing community a lot of them aren't respecting the environment they aren't respecting the communities where they are and there's this bubbling unease about people in vans and i i've noticed it more post covid um and even i'm getting concerned about it because you know they're letting the side down we do try and live responsibly i don't think it's right that you can park outside somebody's house and stay there for a week you know on some residential road but you see these talk these um groups where they're chatting to one another saying we can park where we want we can do what and it's like no not really Mm. well that's back to the film lady in the van of course (laughs) which is uh, which is hilarious if anybody hasn't seen that film it's so funny um because there's this uh, very smart road well it becomes a very smart road in camden and there's no parking restrictions when she starts in 1970 and then they paint yellow lines so she ends up getting a residence parking permit uh, because she gives her address as Alan Bennett's house, which, of course, she doesn't live there. I mean, it's hilarious. It's so funny. It's so funny because it's the response of the neighbours, you know, oh, this terrible van. Um, so it's a similar kind of thing. And I, I I get what you're saying about it's all very well being a free spirit, but you are still living within society and there are rules about living in society and respecting respecting people's, um, well, uh all the things that we've just talked about. We, we know what we're talking about. Um, just, we're nearly running out of time, but I do want to talk a little bit about your book and um, t- tell us about what that is and what your, why you wrote it. And, and also tell us more about your podcast, because I'm sure there are people on this who would love to listen to your podcast. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, I, I wrote the book. Um, it's been out two years now, um, Retirement Rebel, because I wanted to sort of help younger women not fear getting old and older women to have their adventures and to live with vigour. So I've just written about my journey from being broken to being the happiest I've ever been, you know, from retirement to my nomadic life and all the ups and downs that that entailed. And also how I came to be in the position where I felt broken um, to to hit the road. Um, And it's had over 800 reviews on Amazon. It's selling really well. It's on its third print run. So it is resonating with women. A lot of women are buying it for book clubs and I just want to get the conversation going to say there's a lot of women who are older, who are broken. And on that theme, I felt everything seemed to be 50 plus or 55 plus. And when you were 60, it was like we'd fallen off the edge of a cliff and nobody, you know, it's not trendy for the celebs to talk about it. But watch this space because all those trendy celebs and nearly 60, they're all hitting 60. You watch next year. It's all going to be about pivoting at 60 and reliving your life at 60 and blah, blah, blah. And there'll be so many books. Sorry, I'm a, I'm a cynic. But <laughs> so I decided I wanted to do my podcast, Retirement Rebel Life After 60, for ordinary people, not for celebs, to just say, there's a load of us out there doing amazing things. We're living our lives. This is what we do, 60, 70, 80, 90 and beyond, and start our own businesses or whatever. Um, and it was my first series is, was shortlisted for the um, International Women's Podcast Award. So again, that's it's it's, it's being seen, listened to in sixty odd countries, and so I'm really thrilled with that. And I've got another series um, which you're kindly on, uh, coming out at the end of November, beginning of December. Um, so I'd urge people; it's available on any, any platform. But all that has made me 
find my confidence, find my voice and realize that there is a big problem out there. Years ago, women who were pregnant told their bosses and they got sacked. The menopause, their ability to do the job was questioned. And now ageism and bullying when women are older is, is prevalent in the workplace. It's hidden, but there are too many women who were broken like me. And so I want us to get the conversation going and bring the elephant in the room and say, we need legislation to change it. So my book and podcast, I'm hoping are gonna do that. Yeah, it's really interesting what you say. There was a thread on Super Troopers, I think just this last week about somebody who had left uh, her job um, I, because she, she had become incredibly unhappy and ground down by, um, by the attitude of her, of her manager and so on and so forth. So it was, it was quite sad, but she felt liberated as a result of uh, of actually being free, you know, being 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 free. Um, it is quite a big hidden problem. They're having to leave and I want it that they don't leave because they can't get the pension till the nearly 70. So there's this 15 years of toxic environment and women are being forced into poverty because they can't bear it at work and they're having to leave. So we need to change it. Yeah. Well, you and I are always singing from the same hymn sheet yeah. for sure. Uh, you know, really believing in older women, believing in the power of older women and believing in the community of older women. And also the fact that, you know, there is so much life uh, still to be lived. That, and that's the important thing, which you're showing, obviously, um, with a huge amount of get up and go. So full of admiration for that. And um, I love that. I love this free spirited way in which you live and I think it's absolutely uh, to be applauded Siobhan so well done you and um, I'm so glad it's worked out for you as well that you've you you can honestly say that you're you're much better at living in the moment that you're happy and that you you know you're excited about your immediate future and who knows and I know that I inspire other women that's the thing that keeps me going I get hundreds of messages from women who say do you know what you you really have made me think differently about getting old and retiring and that's what I want to do I want to say you may break yeah but you're not broken forever you can find your happy place and there are lots of different ways to do it you know there are lots of different ways to live this um you know this i think of it as the sort of last what is it the last third of your life the last quarter of your life nobody knows but the point is that you don't have to live it exactly how you've always lived it you can live it entirely differently which you have definitely shown when you retire you refire yes <laughs> good I like that I think we might have one or two questions I'm not sure I'm going to go to Amelia now and see if we have some questions we do we have quite a few questions so Sue's asked three questions I'll start with the first one um the choice sounds incredibly enticing and the freedom um do you ever meet couples who have chosen to live this way Yes, I meet quite a lot of couples who've chosen to live this way. And I, I help, I sort of mentor couples who are thinking of doing that. And and they message me all the time on Instagram and I, I kind of support them as much as I can and, and give them advice about doing it. Um, but there are, there are an awful lot of people doing it now. And, and I think it's great seeing them thrive. And next question from Sue. How often do you see your family? Um, quite often I see them. They, they'll they come and meet me on campsites. I've got a brother who's got a, a motor home and a sister, um, her and her partner have got one. But I've just been, I'm, I'm still shaking off a cold and I've just spent a couple of days at my daughter's and literally bunkered back down in bed and she looked after me and that was very nice. Um, but I see family and friends. Do you know what? I have better quality time seeing them now as well because they'll come to a train station. I'll pick them up. They'll spend a couple of days with me. Then I, we've had enough of each other. I dump them back at the train station and they go off home and I go off um, traveling again and then the last one from Sue um, she said it's quite a personal one but have you planned for your very old age and possibly wanting or needing a flat or other permanent accommodation I've got my finances and I could, you know, I'm not going to be um, struggling if I need to find a flat afterwards. But I haven't planned, Sue, because you know what? I don't plan. I go with the flow and I don't like I don't let what ifs self limit me. What if this happened? What did that happen? I've got a dodgy knee and I've just been asked to go on a cycling holiday through the Loire Valley for the Caravan and Motor Club next June. And I've said yes. And now I could think, oh, what if my knee? gives in I won't do but I'm gonna go I'll be peddling that I'll, I'll put ibuprofen on strap it up and I'm off and then from Gaynor 
Um, is getting vehicle insurance difficult and expensive? I've noticed as I've become older, insurance raised the prices, especially from 70 onwards. Yeah, it is expensive. There's no two ways about it. That's my biggest outgoing is the insurance for the motorhome club. It can be anything between 800 and a thousand pounds. What I do to get around the living in it full time, because that can be extortionate, is I do actually do house sitting for three months of the year. Um, so that's when I get to soak in somebody's bath um, and get my washing done. But so I, I house it. So I'm actually only in the motorhome physically nine months of the year. And I make that quite clear when I get my insurance out that I'm in the nine months of the year. And then the last question is from Alison. Do you have any plans to go to Europe? Yeah, I've just been to, I went to the south of France for the first time last year. I was telling everyone to face their fears and I was being a bit of a monkey. I wasn't facing my fear. I was frightened of, of driving. Well, I don't know why I'm whispering. <laughs> I was frightened of driving on the other side of the road. And when I became an ambassador for the Caravan and Motorhome Club, they sussed that out very quickly. So they sent me to France, uh, to Normandy, um, to do um, articles and blogs saying, you know, at 64, it's not, you're not too old, it's not too late to drive on the other side of the road in a motorhome for the first time. I made a, a mess of the tolls and things to begin with, but I, and I filmed it and got used to all that. So I'm showing women, you know, going on the ferry, doing all that. I'm being vulnerable, I'm showing my fears and I'm overcoming them. So that's a good way of showing them that you can do it. They're sending me to Spain next year because I've never been to Spain. So at 65, you're not too old, it's not too late to discover another country in your motorhome. So, you know, I'm fighting the, the, the cause for the older woman in the motorhome. Brilliant. Um, I drove down to the south of France this year and back and... Um, uh, I don't think this is going to sound mad. I mean, I've driven in France for the, you know years and years and years, and I don't think it's any different driving on the other side of the road. <laughs> I found it easier in the end because it was quieter. Because um, like you know, I did a road trip after I did the Normandy trip. Um, a lady that I'd only met once, who owned Jeeps down in the south of France, said to me do you fancy giving me a lift home? Because she was in London and I went, oh yeah, all right. So we booked the ferry and spent two weeks driving down through France. It's all on my Instagram. She's called Honor. And we had a fabulous laugh. We camped in a vineyard. We went all over the place. So the only thing she couldn't do was empty the loo. And I gave in to her because she really was was retching. But she did everything else. She mucked in. She'd never been in a motorhome. And it was great fun having this girl's road trip. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic. Anyway, um, thank you so much. Thank you for the questions. Thank you all for coming and joining us. And uh, I'm sure you've enjoyed that as much as I have. It's been absolutely brilliant, Siobhan. Thank you so much. Just totally salute your spirit of adventure and, um, yeah, full of admiration. And, uh, and well done. And thank you. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I love talking to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Siobhan. Bye-bye, everybody.